Welcome and good evening, good afternoon, depending on where you're calling from, maybe even good morning. Um, my name is Jerry Williams and I am the founder and president of Myositis Support and Understanding Association, uh, MSU. And <clears throat> I'm also a patient living with uh, what's now considered dermatomyositis uh, for 18 years. Pain has always been uh, what was my first symptom and has continued to be a constant struggle in my life as I know it is for many of you out there with uh, myositis of the various forms. Um, so I always just like to point that out that, you know, we know that doctors don't like to address it. Uh, some are getting better, um, but we know that it's real. And um, we know that there are some things that we can do potentially um, that can help. And um, so that's kind of where we're going with this pain series. And uh, this one is gonna be on trauma uh, specifically with chronic pain. So I welcome you to The Tiger at the Door, The Relationship Between Trauma and Chronic Pain with Babette Reeves. Now Babette has joined us in the past and many of you have uh, seen her or known her through um, maybe a support group or something. And uh, she has done uh, various webinars with us. The last one was pain is not a four letter word. And I, we invite you to please uh, take a look at that video if you haven't yet, because that's the one that really kind of explains what chronic pain is uh, some of the available treatment options. Um, so that gives you a good overview. Uh, so uh, as I mentioned, to empower you with knowledge, Babette Reeves <clears throat> joins us. She's a behavioral health specialist at South River Community Health Center, specializing in work with patients with chronic pain and trauma. And she's also living with dermatomyositis. So she has that direct experience of her myositis um, that she brings to the table um, when she presents uh, this stuff to us as well. Um, and again, we're gonna talk about the relationship of trauma and chronic pain. And um, <clears throat> you know, with that, I'm just gonna turn it over to Babette because I'd like her to uh, you know, share any further introduction about herself. Uh, she's, I could read you know, three pages of introduction <laughs> based on her experience and credentials. So I'm not gonna do that because that would bore Babette and probably put everybody else to sleep right now. But Babette, we welcome you and we thank you for joining us. Thank you, Jerry. Um, always glad to be here. Um, you know, just to give you, um, Jerry gave you a good context for what we're doing uh, tonight. And just a little bit more, when I did the webinar on um, pain is not a four letter word, one small piece of it that I kind of flew through was, hey, there's this connection between chronic pain and trauma. Um, we heard back from enough folks that, was like, that were like, oh, can we hear more about this? So here we are. Um, so to let you know, I'm not going to talk real specifically about chronic pain tonight. There will be one section that's super important if you deal with chronic pain. But when I work with uh, my patients with chronic pain, um, what I'm presenting tonight, I present to my patients also one-on-one -on -one in groups and they consistently tell me that it's helpful. So it's information, it's knowledge, it's um, that can help you understand what you're experiencing and why the things that are recommended to help you with your chronic pain, why they're recommended. Um, I'm a big believer in most of the things that we teach and suggest folks to do for chronic pain sound pretty silly and stupid if you don't know how and why they work. So, um, now, one caveat to um, what we're doing tonight, even if you find pretty early on that, oh, this doesn't, this trauma piece doesn't really apply to me, I would still, if you've got the time, you've set aside the time tonight, go ahead and, and stay on throughout because um, I'm a big believer in what we have learned about trauma and especially in the last 20 years. I call it, it's really good public health information. Um, the more people understand what trauma is, what it isn't and how it affects the body, um, the healthier we're going to be as a, as a society. Um, this is just, this is getting to be basic public health information. If it doesn't apply to you, probably one day it's going to apply 
to another family member, a friend, um, you're going to, it's useful information. So um, with, and thanks for that pop-up, um, I will um, do my best to, uh, I'm pretty sure I can leave a nice chunk of time at the end for questions. And, um, you know, we're, we've set aside an hour, but I'm happy to stay a little longer um, for as long as people um, have questions, as long as that works for Jerry. Um, and I'll have some other ways that we can follow up as well. So let's take a look at how trauma and chronic pain um, are related. Now, other thing I need to say, everything I am presenting tonight is research-based. Um, I give sources at the end, and but it is this is not the only, I'm going to say, not the only um, explanation, the only model for understanding um, chronic pain. It's also does not apply to everyone with chronic pain. Okay, but this is research and evidence based and not just my opinion. So we need to start with defining what trauma is and isn't because the word trauma gets thrown around a lot and in a way that's a good thing, but it's also not a good thing if we don't all know what we're talking about or we're not all talking about the same thing. So this is super important. First off, <laughs> there's no standardized definition of trauma. Um, if you start going into the, the research journals, start talking to different psychotherapists, um, different agencies, different institutions, you're going to read and hear different definitions. Most of them have a lot of similarities, but there's nothing that's been standardized about a definition yet. Now, the definition that I use, because again, I have found it to be the most helpful, is this. Trauma is a unique individual experience. It can also be a group experience. Experience of an event or an enduring conditions, a set of enduring repeat conditions in which an individual's ability to integrate their emotional experience of this event the ability to take it in, process it, deal with it is overwhelmed. And then the individual experiences either objectively or subjectively, but they experience a perception of a threat to their life or a threat to their bodily integrity or a threat to a caregiver, family, close friend, somebody they're close to, they're attached to. Okay. I've kind of already highlighted a couple of the big points here. This can be individual or group. One time or repeated event can lead to trauma. Really important part is it's the perception of an experience as a threat. Okay, It's what your survival brain perceives as a threat that can lead to trauma. And it's where resources, the things that support us, get overwhelmed. Now, let me give you a little illustration of what I mean here, okay? So first off, if you have ever been in a house fire, I'm going to use that as the illustration here. So if it's something that you might find triggering, turn down the volume for a few minutes, I'll try to give a thumbs up when I'm done with the illustration. Um, so, but this is just a pretend story, okay? So, Let's pretend that um, tonight my house catches on fire. Three o'clock in the morning, I'm here in Oregon. Oregon is wet, chilly, damp in the middle of the night, whether it rains or not. But I get out, I jump out the window, I get out, I run around the front of the house, standing there in my nightgown, bare feet, cold, damp, Oregon night, and my house is on fire. But the fire department gets there really quickly they start working on it and really quickly the Red Cross shows up. They give me a dry place to sit down, a warm blanket to put around me, a cup of hot coffee. About that time my neighbor comes over. Oh my goodness, I can't believe this is happening. What can I do for you? Do you wanna come over to my house? I can make up the couch, 
tell me how I can help. While she's talking though, she says something that reminds me, oh my gosh, I've got to go to work tomorrow. How am I gonna go to work? All my clothes are in there. Um, what am I gonna do if I can't get to work? Am I gonna lose my job? And then about that point, I'm like, whoa, wait a minute. I've got a great workplace. I've got a great job. They're going to insist I take time off anyway. And even if they don't, I've got paid time off. But thinking about going to work and about my clothes makes me think about all the things in my house. Oh my gosh, the water, the smoke, or what if it all just burns down? What am I going to do? And again, I'm getting all kind of upset. And then I'm like, whoa, wait a minute. I got renter's insurance. I can replace what I need to replace. It'll be a hassle for sure, a stressful thing for sure, but I can replace things. About that time, the EMTs show up and they're checking me out and they think I've broken my arm and I'm like, yeah, I can't deal with a broken arm. I've already got this house fire to deal with. And I take a big breath and I remember I've got medical insurance again. I don't want to have a broken arm. It's going to be one more thing to deal with. It'll be stressful, but you know, four to six weeks, it'll be all healed up. I got the insurance. It'll be okay. And then about that time, my brother shows up. That's scenario one. Scenario two. Okay. Three o'clock in the morning, house on fire. I jump out the window. I get around front, cold, damp, standing in my nightgown watching my house and it takes forever for the fire department to show up. And those EMTs forever to show up, but they get there and they check me out and they're like, oh, you guys think you got a broken arm. And I'm like, I can't have a broken arm. I've already got a house fire to deal with. I can't deal with a broken arm and I don't have medical insurance. And then my neighbor comes over Wah, 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 wah. told you you shouldn't be smoking in bed I did this is all your fault if you hadn't been this that or the other then she says something it reminds me of work I'm like oh my gosh how am I gonna go to work and then it's like oh and I have this awful boss and this awful workplace and you don't show up you're out of a job you're fired and I don't have paid time off and what am I gonna do about all my belongings in my house? I don't have renter's insurance. And my brother never shows up, okay? You kind of feel the difference between those two? Yeah. Generally, people can really feel the difference. The first scenario, here's the thing with trauma. It's not about the event itself. Trauma is not the event. It's when the event happens to us and it overwhelms our resources, then trauma can develop. First scenario, I have lots of resources. That house fire will probably not become trauma in my life. Second scenario, I don't have many resources and it's very likely that that fire will become trauma in my life. Same event, different resources, different outcome. Okay, so this is one of those things it's helpful to know that it's not about the event because if you've been through something and somebody else has been through something and you have different responses and different outcomes, it's probably about the resources that were or weren't there. As I just said, trauma also happens to a person because no one chooses their nervous system's perception or response to this event, okay? Trauma is a nervous system response to an event and we don't get to choose that. So trauma is not the event itself, it's the event, it's the experience, the perception, and then it's what the after effects are. Okay, so let's shift gears. How did we start learning so much about trauma? Okay, one of the pivotal studies of the 20th century, even outside of trauma, in my opinion, is what's called the ACE study. 
Um, and this is where we really started getting the handle on trauma. Okay, a study wrapped up in 1998. It was a study that but with Kaiser Permanente, which is a great big HMO medical organization. You've probably heard of Kaiser and the CDC. The main researcher was Dr. Felitti. And a um, couple of things that make this a really, really, really excellent research study. One is that it is a huge study. Okay, there were over 17,000 participants in this study. And these participants were from average middle class, run of the mill family practice clinics of Kaiser's. Okay, and what Felitti did was he came up with these 10 categories of ACEs, adverse childhood experiences. Okay. And this is a really great graphic of what those ACE categories are, okay? So there's three types of abuse, two of neglect, and five of what he called household dysfunction. So physical, emotional, sexual abuse, physical and emotional neglect, and then household dysfunction, mental illness, someone that's been a family member in prison, a mother who's treated violently, substance abuse, or divorce. Those were the 10 categories of ACEs. And what they did was they selected these over 17,000 patients at these Kaiser family practice clinics. They had them take this ACE thing. Um, they evaluated how many ACEs folks had. And then they started looking at correlations. Okay. Now, a little bit about correlations. Correlations are not cause and effect. Correlations are simply, we've got this thing and this other thing matches up with it. Okay. And there's various ways that we can judge how strong that match is. And I'm going to tell you about a couple of those. Okay. Um, so this is not cause and effect. All right. This is correlations, but you can't do cause and effect with human beings. We can't take babies and children and put them through these ACEs to see whether or not it causes the effects. So correlations are what we do. Okay. Um, so what did they find out? Now, one of the things that the researchers went into, the assumption was, well, these things obviously, everybody assumed that they would cause some psychological difficulties in people later in life. That proved to be true, but they found something they weren't expecting. And I like to say it was such a big surprise. Not only did they rework the data, but I'd say it made the researchers head spin. I mean, it just did not, it was totally unexpected. So let's take a look at some of the results. Okay, so what they found was that, yes, you had emotional consequences if somebody had ACEs, but the surprise was that was there were physical after effects also. The physical was the big surprise. They found that there was, if people had four or more ACEs, okay, four or more ACEs, they were at an increased risk. Risk is not destiny, okay, but increased risk of developing things like COPD, cancer, um, liver disease, on and on and on. I'm going to go through a list in a little bit all these physical things. Side note, the greatest risk that vets have coming back um, from military service, if they have PTSD, their greatest risk at that point, we all hear about suicide, suicide serious in vets. I'm not saying it's not, but their greatest risk is developing diabetes, okay? Directly related to this study, all right? So you have all these physical things that happen if somebody has four or more ACEs. You also have this thing that this graph shows, which is called dose dependence. And it's one of the things that shows that the correlations are really strong, okay? So dose dependence means that as one thing goes up, 
and these bars show the number of ACEs, okay, that the ACE score. As one thing goes up, the other thing goes up. And what was amazing about the ACE study was that there was this really strong ghost dependence, which means that it's really, it's stair step. It's just this stair step thing. And every single thing that they checked out had this dose dependent stair step pattern. Whether they looked at smoking, increased risk of smoking, whether they looked at diabetes, whether they looked at suicide risk, it didn't matter what they looked like. They all had this. That's just stunning, okay? Um, you also had these huge percent of increase risk. Most studies we get excited if there's a two, five, seven percent change in something. Um, I'm going to give you some numbers in a minute, okay? But the numbers are huge. Um, and again, I've already talked about correlation. So let's look at some of these numbers about as far as increased risk. Again, risk is not destiny, okay? But think of previous, you've probably heard of predisposition. If somebody in your family has diabetes, you're predisposed to developing diabetes. Doesn't mean you're going to, but you've got that increased risk. This is the same. So four more ACEs, 260% more likely to develop COPD. 240% more likely to develop hepatitis. 250% more likely to have an STD. 460% more likely to develop depression. 500% more likely to develop alcoholism. Again, remember, this is just based on things that happened as a, to you, to someone as a child. 1,220% more likely to attempt suicide and 4,600% more likely to be an IV drug user compared to somebody with an ACE score of zero. Simply from experiences that happened to someone as a child, okay? This is where the whole, I mean, we just really, the, the research on trauma, Felitti called them adverse childhood experiences. But most of these things, and I'm going to say why in a minute with children, most of these things become trauma if they happen to a child, okay? And um, so a couple of, um, these are taken from a speech that I list at the end. It's only three or four pages. You can find it online. But he found that ACEs are surprisingly common. They're usually not recognized. Oops, there we go. They have an effect usually 30, 40, 50 years later. Sure, they can affect somebody right after or the years after, but especially with the physical after effects, those usually pop up 30, 40, 50 years later. They're the main determinant of health and social well being in the United States. They just are. So why, <laughs> okay, why would this happen? All right, we're gonna shift gears a little bit. And what's cool, I hope you'll find cool when you get to the end of this is everything kind of circles back around. So if you start feeling a little bit lost, just hang with me. We're gonna tie all these pieces back together by the time we get to the end, okay? So I'm gonna shift gears a little bit. I'm gonna talk about the nervous system. Okay, so that then we can look at why ACEs make such a difference. Okay, so now I'm going to run through this really quickly because there's another recording of me that talks just about this brain piece, this nervous system piece. Okay, but here's the nutshell version. All right, brains basically got three big jobs. Okay, one is thinking. The other is emotion and memory, and the other is survival. And I point to these places on my head because those are kind of the areas of the brain that do that work. Okay. So one of the things with trauma 
is remember, it's tied to a perception of threat. So if I open my door here and there's a tiger at the door, my survival brain is probably going to perceive a threat. Okay, when it perceives a threat, it is going to very automatically and extremely quickly tell my body to start pumping out all kinds of hormones. Those are just chemicals. They get pumped out from the glands all over my body. They get transported through my body through the bloodstream. So very quickly, there's going to be this whooshing chemical bath going through my body, getting it ready to fight the tiger run away from the tiger or freeze and play dead. Okay. There are body things that happen. Our heartbeat gets faster. Our breathing gets fast and shallow. Our muscles get tense because those things help us fight, run away or freeze. Okay. So this is very fast. There's no words involved, which is why you can't talk yourself out of this reaction and it's very automatic. Um, other parts of our brain cannot do this job. They are too slow. And the system works really, really well, which is why human beings have survived saber-toothed tigers and all kinds of threats for millennia. It works well. When I jump out the window and get down the street and I get safe from the tiger, then that chemical system that ramped up to get me so that I could do that. Once I get safe, that system ramps back down, except sometimes it doesn't. And when it gets kind of stuck up there at the top, that's when this trauma, we start having these trauma after effects. Okay, I'm going to talk about that a little bit more. Hang with me. So let's look at some of the ways though that this can develop. Just a little review. So there's an event that happens to us. It overwhelms our resources. Then that event can become tra traumatic. When events are repeated, when threat happens over and over again, perception of threat happens over and over again. Again, when there's a perception of threat, it, there's levels to that ramp up, but just think the system ramps up, the chemicals ramp up, the body prepares, okay? When this happens over and over and over again, it starts creating changes in the nervous system. This is more likely to occur when we're younger because the brain is not fully developed. Okay, we don't have all the thinking and all the emotional resources to deal with a threatening event if it happens. Um, children don't understand, what, they're not many adults. Their brains are great, but they're kid brains, okay? And they can't put the pieces and the understanding together. Um, they don't have the, they haven't even learned words for emotions yet. Um, they just don't have all the resources they need. The brain is also changing so fast when we're younger um, that the chemi these chemical changes that happen have a bigger effect on a developing brain. Children also cannot tap into extra resources. That's what adults are for. So if a child experiences something threatening, they're not going to pick up the phone and call up a therapist, <laughs> okay? They don't have that resource ability. Um, so ACEs have a profounder effect on, on us when we're younger for these reasons. There's also a genetic factor that can go along with the development of trauma. Um, it's called epigenetics and um, Basically, this, all these chemical changes that happen with trauma, the traumatic events, um, change, they, they chew up the ends of chromosomes. And it even chews up the ends of sex chromosomes, which means some of those changes can get passed down um, to our children or grandchildren. And they may never experience something that is that threatening to them, 
but they can still have, they have an increased risk and they can still have some of these things develop. So let's circle around. Okay, talk a little more about this ramp up. Okay, so when this ramp up happens repeatedly and the system, if it happens repeatedly, it, it, I, I compare it a little bit to a sticky dimmer switch. You know how a dimmer switch is supposed to move real smoothly to turn the lights up and down just little bits at a time so that you can get just the right ambiance, okay? Well, the dimmer switch, if it gets some little dust and dirt in it, gets kind of sticky, okay? That's one way of thinking about this ramp up that kind of gets stuck. Um, another way is to think of it as a malfunctioning smoke detector, okay? Um, if your smoke detector goes off in your house. What, is, what do you do? Okay, we pretty much all do the same thing. We run in there to the smoke detector and we start blowing on it, wave the dish towel at it, do whatever we can to try to get the thing to shut up because it's making a lot of noise. Okay, this ramp up in a lot of ways is like a lot of noise in our heads. Okay. Um, survival brain has taken over. It's shut down the other two parts of the brain. We can't think. We can't figure things out. We can't make decisions. Our thinking is foggy. We don't remember things. And um, so when the system gets stuck in high gear, it's like the smoke detector that starts going off when you just burn a piece of toast. The house is not on fire, but the smoke detector is still going off just when you burn a piece of toast, okay? So, yeah, and whether it's your smoke detector in your house, whether it's the smoke detector survival brain in your brain, it'd be really great if you could just tell it to stop, tell it that everything was okay. But again, that part of the brain doesn't understand words, so we have to work with it some other ways. But that's part of what's going on. Malfunctioning smoke detector. Another way of looking at this ramp up when it stays kind of in high gear is kind of like having the gas pedal floored on your car and the brake pedal floored. And the engine's going, but it's not going anywhere. Okay. And... Um, it doesn't take much imagination to realize that if that stays like that for a while, it's going to create a whole lot of wear and tear on your car. That's a lot of friction happening when there's all this ramped up, ready to go and nowhere to go. Gas down, brake down. Okay. Another image of what this stuck ramp up is like. So if you think about that going on for decades, okay, that wear and tear, this, this is happening throughout the body, okay? It's systemic, all right? And so it's putting wear and tear and stress sort of everywhere. Um, and it starts creating wear and tear in a lot of places. Now, I'm gonna show you chunks of this next slide. There is no way you can read all these words, but I wanted to cram them all into a slide so you can see what this wear and tear can do. Again, risk is not destiny, okay? Um, all of these things that I'm gonna show you have come from follow-up research studies since the ACE study looking at when people experience threat, when they experience trauma, when they experience ACEs, what happens years later. So we certainly have the emotional, psychological things that happen. Anxiety, panic, phobias, difficulty trusting people, PTSD, depression, bipolar, memory problems, attention problems, thinking problems, impulse problems. Um, blaming yourself, feeling hopeless, people feeling worthless, 
people being really on high alert to danger, anger and irritability problems, um, what we call emotional dysregulation, where emotions are just kind of out of whack all the time. Physical stuff, obesity, damaged blood vessels, ulcers, occult blood, that's blood in your stool or other places it's not supposed to be. Peripheral nerve damage, lower sperm counts, anemia, kidney, liver, lung, heart disease, heart attacks, diabetes, insulin resistance, IBS, chronic pain. There's actually a substance related to chronic pain. It's called substance P um, that increases um, if you experience trauma over time. Reduced ability to fight disease and heal tissue. The immune system gets out of whack. Insomnia, autoimmune diseases. Um, I already mentioned PTSD. Then alcohol and drug use, we've already mentioned. Smoking, eating disorders, suicide. Okay, I'm sure there's more, but those are the ones I collected over the years from a number of research studies all associated with the body, brain, nervous system experiencing trauma. So let's start tying some of these pieces together, okay? So you've got this um, ramp up, these chemical changes happening, the body keeps preparing to fight, flee or freeze every time it perceives a threat Okay, so that's more things going on in the body more often. And so what happens is that the nervous system adapts. There's more stuff going on. Now, I live in a town of about 22,000 people. And so here I tell folks, I tell my patients here, I say, you know, if we woke up tomorrow and our town was a million people, or even 500,000 people with the freeway goes right through the town. Sorry, I should have told you that. Freeway goes right through town, two lanes north, two lanes south. So if we wake up tomorrow and there's 500,000 people here, they're going to have to expand the freeway. They're going to have to put in more lanes because there's going to be more cars out there. And that's basically what the nervous system does when this is going on all the time. There's more things going on. We got to have a bigger interstate. And the nervous system actually grows more cells and does more wiring. It expands, okay? So there's more signaling going on and there's a larger nervous system to handle that signaling. And that creates this thing called central sensitization, okay? Central sensitization, central means the central nervous system, brain and spinal cord, okay? Sensitization means that it's gotten sensitized by increased signaling and by an increased number of nervous cells. And I compare it to you have stereo, amp, whatever, your radio in your car, and you turn, you know, you got it turned down low and the song is nice, but then you turn it up high and sit right by the speaker and it's pretty painful. Okay, the sound is basically the song is the same, but the volume makes all the difference. Central sensitization is where the volume is turned up on the stimuli that our nervous system is processing. Okay. Oh, where's there it is. So um so the brain starts receiving signals with the volume turned up on them and it processes them that way, okay? Some of this is set by genes, but a lot of it is changed by these chemical, the hormones that I've talked about and neuroplasticity just means that the nervous system has changed. Trauma, remember, also affects these two things. It causes hormone changes and it causes changes in the nervous system, okay? You start seeing the overlap, start seeing the connection. Here's another piece where trauma and chronic pain start connecting, okay? So I, I wish I could do this. I can't figure out how to do this on PowerPoint, but I want you to just look at the blue line for right now, okay? So 
the blue line shows normal, what we call autonomic regulation. Okay, we're gonna get a little geeky here with our biology, all right? So autonomic basically means automatic. It's all those systems in your body that just do their thing. Breathing, heart rate, blood pressure, blood pH, they just tick along, okay? But the body is not static. Things go up a little bit, and if they do, follow the blue line, then the body's going to work to bring it back towards the middle. That's called homeostasis. The body is always trying to keep us around that midline, okay? So my temperature goes up just a little bit, and my body's going to work to bring it back towards the middle. And then maybe it drops a little bit and my body is going to work to bring it back up towards the middle. If you take your temperature every 15 minutes, every half hour, it's going to be a little bit different every time. Same is true for your pulse, your blood pressure, everything. Okay. Your body's not static. It's always changing. Okay. But it's also always staying in this pretty narrow range around that midline body's really good at regulating itself, okay? Now, what happens when threat, uh, threat, uh, threat, uh, okay? <laughs> the system gets dysregulated. It gets out of whack. It's that sticky dimmer knob. It goes down a little bit and then it gets stuck and you keep trying to get it down and all of a sudden it goes down, okay? Or all of a sudden it goes up, all right? That's the red line. The body's still trying to bring it back to the midline, okay? But it's, it's got this stickiness in the nervous system now, all right? Now, combine this. This happens after trauma, okay? Autonomic dysregulation. Combine that now with central sensitization. What if your nervous system has now changed and it picks up? all these changes, okay? Before, you probably never noticed when your heart rate went up or your heart rate went down. But you got central sensitization, guess what? It might be noticeable now because your nervous system is, is processing more signal and it's bigger and it's just, it's picking up stuff and telling your brain about it where it didn't before, okay? Yeah, it's <laughs> pretty fascinating. So let's start summarizing. Another definition, and this is from a Dr. Scare. Um, I didn't make this up, is that trauma is autonomic dysregulation. It's where the automatic systems in our body, because of these perceptions of threat, those systems get dysregulated, out of whack. They still function and they still get back to midline the majority of the time. That's why we're still all living, breathing, functioning. We're still alive, but we got these, um, yeah, going on. This leads to the wear and tear. It leads to chronic illness, it leads to central sensitization, and it leads to chronic pain can also lead to difficulties with anxiety and panic, insomnia, because that's regulated by an autonomic system, other sleep disorders, changes in metabolism. One of the things when you perceive a threat is your, your digestion shuts down. If that happens enough or gets into this dysregulation, then your body doesn't quite know what to do with the calories that it consumes, okay? Um, metabolism gets dysregulated. And um, yeah, people start talking about, I'm gaining weight, but I, I'm, I don't know why I'm not eating any differently. Dr. Felitti actually got curious and developed the ACE study because he was, he was studying people losing weight. Um, and there were some very curious things happening that, that he wanted to try to figure out. And that's how he, that's how he discovered ACEs, okay? Um, and then kinesiophobia. This is a big fancy word. Kinesio means muscles. Phobia means you're scared of it. And this is where your, your, your nervous system develops 
um, fearful, um, survival threatening reactions to your body, which is what I was describing with that autonomic dysregulation. Okay. Um, and, and we get, we get scared of doing things with our body and we get scared of what our body is doing just automatically. Can I ask a question, Babette? Sure. Is that this autonomic dysregulation, can that uh, cause fluxes in your blood pressure and things like that as well? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. It, that's, that's exactly. Okay. <laughs> yeah. Um, Scare, uh, he's a neurologist. One of the things he points out is that every illness, trauma related or not, whether it's having a cold, whether it's having appendicitis, um, every illness is, is actually based in autonomic dysregulation. Something gets out of whack. And until the body, and the body is geared to heal that because it heals that by bringing things back to that midline, that homeostasis point. Um, but when trauma's gotten wired into our nervous system, it makes it really hard for the body to do that healing that it's naturally geared to do. Right. Um, so every illness is based in autonomic dysregulation. Yeah. So here's the summary slide. And then I've seen lots of questions coming in. So we're going to have fun. So remember, trauma and chronic pain, they're connected and they're a brain thing, okay? Long-term ramp up either from trauma or for pain, and I let me tie this, um, pain is also perceived as a threat in the brain. So repeated experiences of pain can also create this ramp up stickiness um, and lead to central sensitization, even without the trauma piece, okay? Because pain is also perceived as a threat. So it makes, they make changes in the nervous system. So chronic pain, chronic illness are about systemic, autonomic dysregulation. I'm ready for questions. Well, thank you so much, Babette. It's so much information, right? So <laughs> I think, I think some people are, are still trying to kind of uh, get it in their heads still. I know that I am. It's wonderful information. Um, I would like to ask uh, a question about the ACEs. I have seen uh, you can take ACEs online. There's the abilities uh -huh. to do that. What is the benefit of, of filling out something like that? What does that kind of tell you? Yeah. Um, one of the things about um, getting an ACE score is that, um, I mean, as Felitti found, I mean, like the 17,000 people that they used in that study, the ones that they found had high ACE scores. They, most of them, as he said, it goes unrecognized. Most, a lot of people, less so now, because I mean, that was 20 years ago. There's been a lot of talk about trauma, a lot of talk about ACEs. But especially 20 years ago, people didn't recognize that the things that had happened to them um, had had an effect on them. People don't make that connection just naturally, okay? Um, it's kind of like early germ theory, you know? The idea that there was something that was invisible could make you sick. Um, I mean, it was decades before people got on board with germ theory. Um, in fact, the first doctor that um, said that we needed to wash our hands before having surgery on people, he was run out of practice. Um, Isn't that something? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so, so 20 years ago, this, this idea ACEs was that same sort of thing. It was like, here, folks, you need to start recognizing that these things that have happened to you could have had a profound effect effect on you. And people would assume it would just be, oh, so I'm, I'm, I'm more likely to be depressed or I'm more likely to have anxiety, but they didn't recognize that it could have an effect on their body, especially 30, 40 years later. 
So if you don't recognize ACEs, then you can't prevent them and you can't prevent their progression. And, um, and you, can't, you can't get people into treatment, you know? A, a lot of folks that have experienced trauma minimize what's happened to them. Um, I, I mean, you don't know the number of people that say to me, um, well, no, nothing, nothing traumatic's ever happened to me because worse things have happened to other people. And that's not the way it works. Um, right. That's why that, that what your brain perceives as a threat is the most important piece. Um, so ACE, um, you know, the whole ACE score thing was mostly a, kind of a, a public health thing of if we don't look for it, we're not going to see it. If we don't see it, we can't prevent it. And we can't treat it. Great. Thank you. I, I appreciate that explanation. The, um, is there a certain, are they all pretty much standardized? <clears throat> I know that I've seen them available on different sites here and there. Is, is it a pretty standardized thing? Um, the page for information on ACEs that I really recommend to folks is, it's, it's all one word. If you just type it into the browser, it's ACEs Too High. So A-C-E-S, ACEs, two, T-O-O, H-I-G-H. -H. ACEs, too high, um, really reputable, reputable site. Um, the woman that, that um, manages that site is a science journalist. Um, you'll find a, a version of the, the um, short, now, just to clarify, the ACE test that Felitti used, each of those ACEs that were on that graphic was a category of questions, okay? Right, there's quite a few of them to yeah. take, right? It's not just like one. <laughs> yeah. One okay. so, when you, so when you pick up one online or even on ACEs too high, it's just gonna be 10 questions. Um, but it'll give you, it'll give you a good, a really good ballpark, yeah. Great, thank you. Uh, so Stacy, uh, she's a therapist and she wanted to say thank you. You connected the pieces between the ACE, which she uses with her patients, and how this moves to chronic pain as an adult. Thank you. You're welcome. I, it's, I mean, I, I, I'll just say, Stacy, that um, it, there's lots of ways to explain ACEs, use ACEs, understand ACEs. There's lots of ways to understand trauma and chronic illness and chronic pain. Um, you know, I, I shared this one because it's, it's helped me with my understanding and my practice and it's, and it's helped my patients. They, they tell me that consistently. So. Thank you. And thank you, Stacy, for, um, taking the time to, to let her know. Um, Rhiannon, can trauma be cumulative? Can the mind body be okay with a certain number of episodes of trauma, but then the kind of like a last straw episode triggers central sensitization triggering the chronic pain, et cetera. Yeah, um, I think the, um, you know, it, it's a, probably a little bit of chicken and egg. I don't think anybody can say for certain whether it's like the, the, the next traumatic event does it or whether it's just that cum accumulation of wear and tear. Um, but one of the things about when something happens to us and it becomes trauma in our life is it, it just, frankly, it just doesn't go away. Um, and it's not just an, I hope what you take away from here is this is not just an emotional thing. Okay. For decades, we approach trauma as just an, you know, we need to work with people's thoughts and emotions around what happened to them. But what we have learned is this is a body thing. Um, and we need to work with the body also. And, um, but those, that, that trauma response um, doesn't just go away when an event goes away. Um, and um, so, yeah, it, it accumulates over time. And that would be indicated by those higher uh, A scores, I guess, right? Yeah. Or 
Um, it, two for three. You, you could get an indication of it from that, but it's also, um, you know, you. For instance, I see a lot of women who come in and, and I mean, doctor's offices see a lot of women who come in and they've been they've been perfectly healthy until they hit like their 40s and 50s. And then it's like this goes wrong and this goes wrong, and this goes wrong, this goes wrong, and this goes wrong. It's just like this domino effect. Um, and you know, this, this model helps us understand what's happening there. This wear and tear has been throughout the body. And when it finally is worn and torn, um, then kind of everything starts uh, struggling or having a problem. And that sort of domino thing um, of I was fine. And now all of a sudden I've got six major illnesses. What the heck is going on? Is that accumulation of the wear and tear over the years? Right. All right. Thank you. Uh, Teresa, uh, in March, had a kidney stone uh, caused sep sepsis. She was septic. Uh, since then, she's been told in two separate instances that the pain in her knee and shoulder blade are a result of the trauma. Uh, this is in agreement with your presentation, question mark. Thank you for this. I wish my whole family could have been here. Yeah, it's, um, and, and, what I hope, what I think I'm hearing you say that you heard was that I'm not making this up. This is something that my body, um, it's, it's got this dysregulation piece going on and um, my nervous system is over responding and, um, and it's creating some pain in some, in some other areas, probably cause of a bit of sensitization going on. And that shoulder pain, that knee pain that probably were already there because the volume's been turned up because of sensitization, your brain's picking that up now. Um, I'm going to tell you, just understanding that can help start turning the volume down. And then um, find the video where I talk about, or the postings where I talk about breathing. Um, deep breathing always communicates to your autonomic nervous system that you're safe. And over practice regularly over time, it'll start turning that volume down. Yes, yeah, very important. Another way of putting it is, is it's, I, I can't give you any research on this, but I've seen it happen and I believe it and it makes sense. If the nervous system can wire this away to get more sensitive, I don't see any reason why it can't rewire back the other way. You're not going to go back to where you were before. We know that, but it doesn't have to be turned up as loudly. Great. Thank you. Yeah. It's sometimes good just to get that validation to know that, like you said at the start of your reply, I'm not, you know, it's not in my head. And I think that's why she really wishes her whole family could have been here. And uh, Maybe they'll be willing to watch the recording, Teresa. I hope so. Um, so Vanessa, how can I apply this knowledge to a treatment plan for dermatomyositis? Anything that's going to help your body regulate, okay? Um, and so things like, okay, so a lot of dysregulation is, ba well, dysregulation is based in perceived threat. Um, most of the time now when you're probably safe, okay? So it's a misperception going on in this survival brain. But remember that survival brain doesn't think. So we can't just be logical and talk about it. Um, so we have to do things with our body to communicate to that brain that we're safe. Things like deep breathing, things like relaxation exercises, things like um, whether it's audios that take you through a visualization that's relaxing, anything that creates safety, feelings of safety in your body, feelings of safety by changing your environment, um, those things will start to turn down the volume on that sensitization. And that's what's going on in our immune systems. I mean, our myositis is from an overactive immune system. And so as we start to turn down the volume, then that system will start to calm down also. Um, but again, it's not, about, it's not about talking about it. It's about doing things 
that communicate safety in our body. Um, doing things, um, not letting our fear run away because if we get too focused on the central sensitization, then the emotion of fear will kick in, threat will kick in. Threat's different than fear. The threat perception will kick in the fear. So the times when you notice fear, you do one of the things that helps you regulate. So the breathing, your favorite relaxation. I had a, I had a woman that learned when things got too stressful at work, she practiced visualization so much with her happy place. I, I think it was at the beach that when things got too work stressful at work, she got so good at it that she could get up from her chair and walk to a window and look out the window for just a couple of minutes, which was cool with work. Um, and do a little mini visualization of her happy place and, and everything would, would ramp down. Um, so that's a real nutshell, maybe some future, <laughs> some future talks. Yeah. Um, I think it's important here um, that, you know, everybody watch the first video because that's where all of these things are really, uh, really discussed, um, you know, and, it helped me to better understand that, like you said, you can't talk to a survival brain. You know, you can't just, you know, all right, stop it. Just stop. You, it doesn't understand your words. So you have to do things like the breathing and the relaxation in order for those things to be uh, effective. So it's all coming together, but you have to watch them. And that's why it's a series. So if you yeah. haven't watched it, I am posting uh, the link right now in the chat section. Uh, it'll take you right to uh, that video. Uh, thanks for the question, Vanessa. Um, Rhiannon has another question. Do physically traumatic events and psychotic trauma episodes have equal power as triggers for chronic pain, et cetera? In a nutshell, yes, because the short answer is survival brain is not a thinking part of the brain. And so survival brain does not, it, it, it cannot sort out different types of threats. A perceived threat is a perceived threat, period. That's all survival brain knows. So it doesn't matter what the threat is. It doesn't matter whether the threat is real or not. Um, I mean, that's how flashbacks work, okay? Is that I'm perfectly safe when I have a flashback of something that happened ages ago, but survival brain perceives it as real and goes into ramp up, okay? so. The, the short answer is anything that's perceived as a threat. Survival brain does not distinguish between types of threat. And Richard, uh, thank you for a most informative presentation. My apologies for tuning in a bit late. Has the term psychosomatic been used and or does it have any implications here? Okay, ooh, I love this question. <laughs> um, <laughs> and Dr. Scare loves this question too, okay. So Dr. Scare, the neurologist I mentioned, and he's on the source slide at the end. Um, he says, I say, um, psychosomatic is a word that needs to be thrown away. Um, it just, based on what we know about the nervous system, it really is, it, it, it has no meaning anymore. It, it, it's, you know, it's a word we used when we didn't know any better. Um, but now there's a little caveat to that. Are there people that really truly believe they're sick and there really, really, really truly is nothing wrong? Yes, um, it's rare. It's really rare, <laughs> okay? Um, and we don't even, in, in therapy land, we don't even diagnose that as any kind of psychosomatic. It's got really specific diagnostic labels. Okay, so psychosomatic, um, it's all in your head. Well, yeah, if you're talking about your nervous system, that's true. But when people use the word psychosomatic, they're usually meaning, oh, you're making it up. And that's not true. Uh, we need to get rid of the word. One cent uh, once central sensitization is triggered, does the adult brain still have enough plasticity to unwire the central sensitization? Adult brains have neuroplasticity. My age, I was taught that, you know, once your brain was formed, that was it. Nothing ever changed. We've learned that that's not true. Brains can rewire. 
And again, if they can rewire towards sensorial sensitization, I don't, there's nothing about the science that suggests to me that they can't rewire back the other way. Can we say how long that takes? No. Can we say exactly what would it take to do that? No, we don't have that much information yet, but it just, it just makes sense. If it can rewire one way, it can rewire back the other way. And I've seen it in patients. Well, great. <clears throat> All right, well, that is uh, the end of the Q&A. And um, did you have anything else, uh, Babette, that you wanted to add or follow up with since- I don't think so, but, you know, appreciate everybody um, attending tonight and great questions. If you want to get in touch with me, um, feel free either, Jerry can, you can funnel it through Jerry, or I think my email's on the, uh, one of the end slides as well. Um, so, you know, happy to follow up with um, questions or point you towards some resources um, if that's helpful. Thank you so much. And uh, yeah, anybody, you know, if you do have something specific for Rivette, just let me know. My email is jerry at understandingmyositis.org. Uh, it's pretty simple. Um, and uh, we'll talk with Babette soon about scheduling the next in the series. I don't know if that'll be uh, by the end of this year or we may uh, be in 2021, uh, but uh, we look forward to that. And you can also find uh, some of the posts that she was uh, talking about on the breathing. If you're in our Facebook group, you will find those posts. If you search under the Facebook topic tag, mental health, you will find uh, all of those. So uh, happy reading, happy deep breathing. <laughs> and uh, <laughs> thanks again, Babette. We really appreciate your time. And thank you all for attending tonight. And uh, we just look forward to seeing you again. And we're here if you need us. Thank you. Good, Good night, night, folks. Good night, everyone. <laughs>